Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for being with us here tonight, taking some time out of your busy personal, personal days and schedules to come and talk about a really, really important topic, which is funding for our public education system, our public schools, and our public school students. I am very glad to uh, get us started tonight. I want to introduce a couple of pieces and we'll welcome our host uh, to, to kind of officially welcome us to the event. Uh, but as you see, we have an ASL interpreter here, Kathy, who will be able to provide some uh, interpreting for those who need some assistance, as well as a Spanish interpreter, Eddie, who is available. And so I wanna make sure that I acknowledge that for anyone who is in the room who might need some assistance. So with that, I'll invite Nancy Dishner up from the Nicewanger Foundation to officially welcome us to the space. And good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for taking the time to come and inform this conversation that can make a significant difference for the children of the state of Tennessee. When I think about, well, first of all, I guess I should say, I'm Nancy Dishner from the Nicewanger Foundation, and uh, we are very proud to be co-hosts of this event with uh, Scott Nicewanger, and I would like to welcome you to the Nicewanger Performing Arts Center and to the beautiful town of Greenville. The reason that the success of our students and the future of our state will be very much in, in large measure because of the collective energy of the people in this room, the work that we put into it with our hands and with our hearts. And so with that in mind, we want to think about the people that are in this room, those like me who already have our children grown and have already taken great advantage of the public schools in the state of Tennessee, but there's also young parents who are just starting that journey with their children. There are educators in the room and there are retired educators perhaps to be part of this conversation business leaders who understand that economic development is directly tied to the quality of an educational system, healthcare workers who know that when we look at health disparities, we can also match that up against educational level. And they're just citizens who want to be part of the conversation because they care about our state and they want to see it be the best it can possibly be. So for whatever reason you are in the room tonight, or those who've joined us by live stream and are participating in the conversation in that way, I believe you're here because you know that students' educational attainment is important and because education does make a difference in lives. So thank you for being part of that conversation. We want to particularly welcome our very dear friend, the Commissioner of Education, Penny Schwinn, and we thank the, the State Department for choosing the Nicewanger Performing Arts Center for this event this evening. And as co-host of the event with us, among the co-hosts, as uh, Greenville City Schools, and so I'm very pleased for Steve Starnes to come and also be part of this welcome. Thank you, Nancy. As she said, welcome to Greenville. We're glad you have chosen to come out tonight and engage in this very important conversation. We believe this conversation is critical to the future of public education and that public education is, is critical to our future as a state. So again, thank you for coming out and uh, look forward to engaging in this conversation with you and hearing your thoughts. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Director Starnes. We are very excited to get this conversation started. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are here to talk about a very important topic. I wanna to begin by introducing myself. My name is Chelsea Crawford. I am Chief of Staff at the Tennessee Department of Education, and you are part of one of eight regional town halls that we are doing to talk about public education funding and public school students here in the state of Tennessee. Really tonight, we are wanting to hear from you. I wanna take a moment just to acknowledge the screen behind me and the QR code. Most of you all, when you came in the door this evening to register for this event, had a chance to sign up to speak. I wanna call out and make sure to remind you of that opportunity because we truly want to hear from you all tonight. Please use these next couple of minutes to go on and sign up. If you would like to talk for just a couple of minutes later this evening to tell us about what you would like to see in the future as it relates to public school funding, hopes and dreams, visions, and opportunities that lie ahead. 
While the Department of Education is very excited to work with you on this opportunity to discuss the state's formula for public education funding, we would like to remind you of the following. Conversations on this topic are not intended to reflect the current BEP funding formula. The current BEP funding formula will remain in place until a new funding formula is recommended to and approved by the Tennessee General Assembly. The public is encouraged to submit comments in writing to ensure all communications are thoroughly documented and can be reviewed and considered in the future. Public comment is encouraged to focus on developing a new funding formula rather than revising the current funding formula. Consider what should be funded and at what level. Subcommittees will be responsible for reviewing public comment and making recommendations for what should be included in a new funding formula. While all committees, subcommittees, and members of the public should feel free to communicate openly, documents and records may be subject to public inspection pursuant to the Tennessee Public Records Act and may be publicly posted or otherwise made available. All recommendations that are submitted by committees and subcommittees will be reviewed and considered, but not all recommendations will ultimately be included in the new proposed funding formula. So I've just said a lot of words and really wanna boil it down for you all again and say that we're here to talk about the future. We wanna hear about what you would love to see in the state of Tennessee as it relates to public school students and funding for their futures. I want to talk just a moment about how this event will work tonight, and then I'll invite Commissioner Schwinn to give us some opening comments to really kind of give us a grounding for our discussion. We are going to invite public comment. As I mentioned, everyone will have a couple of minutes to share what you would like to see for the future. And I will be calling names of individuals who are ready to speak. So when I call your name, I will ask that you just kind of raise your hand so that I can identify you in the audience. Scott or Victoria on this side will be running a microphone to you all. Would ask that when you do speak, keep that close to your mouth so that everyone in the room and those who are streaming at home can hear what you have to say. You'll have a couple of minutes when your minute begins. I will let you know and kind of step away from the microphone. When I come back to the microphone, that is kind of my friendly reminder that your time is coming to a close. And then we'll go on to the next speaker. So really want to make an opportunity for everyone to share. I know that this is very near and dear to all of our hearts. I want to be respectful of your time and also try to get you home by dinner. So um, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Commissioner Schwinn to talk a little bit about the topic at hand and what we would like to hear from you. Thank you all. Hello, good evening to everyone. It's nice to see you. It's nice to be back in this beautiful center at this most beautiful time of year. I took some pictures on the way in and sent them to my mom. Um, she is very jealous, and so that always makes me feel a little bit good. Um, so she'll come out and visit a little more. So happy to be here and talk about what I think is one of the most important policy decisions and one of the most impo important policy considerations we can make as a state and what that means for our students and our future. So when we think about school funding, and we think about this conversation, I wanna root that in a vision forward, thinking about what is possible, operating with optimism and a sense of possibility, and all of that rooted in students. And so the why now, why are we having this conversation in this particular moment in time? I think there are a number of reasons. We've learned a lot of lessons going through what has been our third very tough school year and impacted school year. There are a lot of things that we have learned. There are a lot of ways that we have grown in education, and it's a good time to rethink and reevaluate how we might wanna fund our public schools. We also know there are a lot of federal dollars that have come into all of our states, and so when we're making transitions, potential transitions, we wanna make sure that we have the resources to ensure all of our school districts are able to uh, be agile and move and adjust and take advantage of any potential changes. And third is we know there is a lot that we want to be true for our kids right now. And we need to make sure that when we think about building a new funding system, that we are taking into account all of those needs of all of our students across the state. Now we're talking about a student-based funding formula. And I know um, whenever I bring that up at home, my whole family starts to fall asleep and they're thinking, okay, what does this have to do with me? And why is mom talking about this again? But why I bring it up, especially with my two little girls, is I've got three kids, baby Jack's not in school yet, so I'll leave him out for now. But my two girls are very different. We call them salt and pepper, because Ellie's a little salty and Abby's pretty fiery. And they have very different needs. I don't think they're gonna have the same education experience. I want them to be successful and to achieve their greatest dreams. Ellie wants to be a dinosaur vet, 
still, um, and great, maybe someday that will be a job. Abby wants to be an inventor and an influencer, whatever that means. Those are two very different jobs for two very different kids. That doesn't matter as long as we know that our public schools are equipped and resourced in a way to ensure that both of my girls can achieve whatever dreams they set for themselves. And that has to be true for every single one of the almost one million students in our state. What we are doing in public education, and you're gonna hear me say public schools and public education a lot, because this is a formula about public schools and public schools only, it's a public school formula. And we want to ensure that whatever we are building provides every single child, no matter where they live, no matter where they come from, no matter what they want to be when they grow up, it provides every single one of them with the opportunity to thrive and be successful after they graduate. A student-based formula looks at the individual needs of students, it funds the needs of those students to achieve those dreams, and then collectively creates that district budget. What we have seen across the country is that almost every state is now moving towards a student-based funding formula. That is almost three dozen states. We're at 35 or 36 right now. And they're moving that way because they know that when we fund student needs and think about the needs of the child, we are actually funding that child to be successful in the future. It is incredibly important for us to think about that now. What you heard Chelsea say and what you're, you'll hear me say one more time is that this is about building something new and creating something new. What I encourage all of you to think about is what you want. I think we've gotten very good as a country, especially over the last 18 months, to tear down and think about all the things we don't like about something. It's a different muscle memory to start to think about what you might build, what could be to create, to live in that positive, open-minded, forward-thinking space. I encourage all of you to do that because we can build something really special and create a legacy together of what is possible for school funding in the state of Tennessee and what that means for students in the state of Tennessee. It is one of the most important things that we will do. The community engagement is incredibly important. And what will happen as part of this process, as Chelsea said, is every single piece of information will come in. It will be coded to one of our 18 subcommittees. Those 18 subcommittees will look at every single piece of information. They'll review it, they'll consider it, and then make formal recommendations. Those recommendations will include either what has to be in a formula, must be in a formula, what should be, what is a nice to have, and then what I call the hopes and dreams and wishes that maybe someday you never know could happen. They'll have all of those. They will uh, essentially say how much each of those costs, provide recommendations, and those folks who have been um, selected by the General Assembly on the steering committee will review those recommendations and ultimately will create it that way. I firmly believe that good policy requires the voice of the people who are represented in those policies, and that's part of what we want to do. Open up as many different avenues for people to contribute, whether that's here tonight, whether that's the hundreds and hundreds of emails we've already received, the Twitter town halls, the local town halls and community organization town halls that are happening all across the state. Everyone needs to feel like they can be part of the process to inform the process. That's how good informed policy gets made. That's how we ensure all voices can get heard. And on something as important as school funding, which impacts every single student in the state and by and large, every single person in the state, because either you're hiring our future, our students and our future workers, you're living next door to them, you're seeing them in the, in the neighborhood grocery mart, whatever that is, it matters. This matters deeply for our state and our future. So I encourage you to think big, dream big, you never know. Um, but I don't think we are doing our jobs if we're not thinking boldly on behalf of kids. And I'm just so grateful that you are here participating in the process. And I really look forward to the conversation tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Very excited to get our period of public comment started. As I mentioned, I will call the name of the person who is uh, immediately ready to speak, and then I will call the name of the person who will be up next so that we can bring those microphones out to you. Uh, very first speaker this evening is Meredith McGann. Meredith, if you could raise your hand for me. I see you. Yes, ma'am, we'll bring a microphone to you. Following Meredith will be Micah Van Hus. Mr. Van Hus, if I could see your hand, please. I see you way back there. Yes, sir, we'll bring a microphone to you. And with that, Ms. McGann, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. All right, thank you. So first, I want to extend my gratitude to the department for hosting these events and creating this forum, and to the commissioner and everyone here tonight representing the various organizations in Greene County. My name is Meredith McGann. I'm with Tennesseans for Student Success. I'm a school counselor by training, and I'm passionate about working to create an educational landscape that works for all students, and I know that's why you're all here too. 
So I am working to advocate for a new funding formula that fully funds all students and schools through increased funding, increased support for high needs and rural districts, greater transparency so that families are able to advocate for their students' needs and ensure they are adequately and holistically supported. So these town halls are a wonderful opportunity to share our voices and for continued engagement, but continued conversations is what is going to keep this issue at the forefront of the legislators' minds going into the next session. So my role with TSS is to gather and amplify those community voices through continued conversations so that we can share with legislators as they write, debate, and vote on policies that will directly affect all students. So if you would like to become involved in further advocacy with us or just hear more information or gather resources, I'm going to be in the back after this town hall, and I would love to meet as many of you as you would like. Thank you so much again to the commissioner and the department. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, next up, as I mentioned, is Micah Van Hus. Following Micah will be Jeff Taylor. Jeff, if you could raise your hand for me, sir. I am looking for you. Oh, I see. Yes, sir. Um, okay, with that, Mr. Van Hus, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Thank you, ma'am. I am uh, Micah Van Hus. I am a parent uh, in Washington County Schools. My daughter started kindergarten uh, this year, uh, but I am not here on behalf of the parents. I am uh, the grassroots engagement director for East Tennessee for Americans for Prosperity, and it is on their behalf that I am here tonight. I do want to take a moment to thank Commissioner Swin and Governor Lee for tackling the BEP formula. Uh, I did serve in the legislature for the last eight years in Washington County. Uh, Mr. Hicks right here is my successor. And um, I do know how, how much of a monster the BEP is. Every time we try to come up with a good piece of legislation to help our kids in the schools, um, it was always an excuse that nobody wants to touch the BEP. You cannot amend the BEP. And so it was always a, a roadblock to getting things done uh, for our students. So uh, Americans for Prosperity advocates uh, that this new funding formula uh, is centered around our kids uh, for their success um, to give them innovation to allow them to innovate, to allow them to experience. Uh, some of the states around the nation have, have gone to a four-day school week and then on the fifth day, uh, the students are able to go uh, do a program that they're very interested in, maybe for their future, or learn about things that they're interested in. That may not be the solution for Tennessee, uh, but it is an example of uh, allowing our students to innovate uh, and experience. Uh, another thing that Americans for Prosperity advocates for uh, is getting rid of red tape. Um, we want to enable our local educators to craft, to have the financial freedom to craft their schools. I've got a couple of local educator, local leaders uh, from Washington County sitting here next to me that I worked with for a while. And um, so we want to give them the ability to craft uh, their, at their local school level. And also that those funds uh, are transparent, that the parents can see where their taxpayer dollars are going. The last point uh, today that Americans for Prosperity wants to advocate for is for the pension system. Uh, right now across the nation, we have almost $250 billion, not Tennessee, but the nation, $250, $250 billion of, of unfunded pension systems. So we would like to move to from a pension system and transform into a employee-centered, employee, employee opt-in system, such as 401k uh, for retirement. And so, Again, uh, that would uh, take some funding that's get, getting away from our students right now and putting it back to being able to educate the students. Um, but again, I do want to thank Governor Lee, uh, Commissioner Swin uh, for tackling this thing. I also want to thank uh, Representative David Hawk. Uh, I worked with him for eight years, and I know David's very passionate uh, about this issue. He has a young daughter uh, still in the schools. And so, but if anybody wants to uh, work with Americans for Prosperity, we knock on a lot of doors. I was in Virginia the last two days. We make a lot of phone calls. I'll be around afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Hus. Uh, next up is Mr. Jeff Taylor. Following Jeff will be Laura Hunt. So, Laura, if you could raise your hand. Yes, I see you. Uh, we'll bring a microphone over to you, ma'am. And with that, Mr. Taylor, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Yes, good evening and welcome to Greene County. I'm Jeff Taylor, President and CEO of the Greene County Partnership. I'm also the child of two educators, so, and I live with an educator. Uh, who I'm very proud of that she's a doctor in early childhood studies, which is one of the reasons uh, I'm speaking so quickly. I'm a little surprised by this. <laughs> but anyway, um, really my comment or, con or expression here is that uh, working through workforce development is later in life uh, education. Uh, living with an educator that is still teaching, uh, I guess the hope, the future 
is to discuss, because we have lived in other states beside the great state of Tennessee, and oh, by the way, welcome again, and thank you for doing this, is that we look at pre-K. Um, too often the conversations, we always talk about building a house, and it starts with the foundation. We have to start with our foundation first, because we're pouring millions and millions of dollars later in education when we should start with a solid foundation. And when I talk to my peers, I talk to other parents, and I'm very fortunate we're close to being empty nesters. I've got three more semesters of college and I'm done. Um, is that people talk about kindergarten. I'm like, kindergarten, when we were there 10 years ago, it's not kindergarten. We require students to do so much more now, but yet our parenting, as we know, we have an issue there, is not, our children aren't prepared to even start kindergarten. And we're one of those states that doesn't have mandatory pre-K. And my wish, my desire, my hope is to hope that we fund that and we get to that point. We talked to Representative Hill not too long ago at an ECD event because we've got to connect that dot because if our children don't start out on solid foundation and we're working with growth and we're measuring are you a four or a five, let's not worry about the growth. We'll already have them there. And then we're building, not trying to attain something because we've already started the race three steps behind. So thank you again for the opportunity. And always, we love that you're here in Greene County. Come back and visit anytime. Thank you so much, Mr. Taylor. You got done in under two minutes, so very well done. Uh, thank you so much. Laura Hunt is our next speaker who is just down here in front of me. Following Laura will be Joe Crabtree. So Joe, if you could raise your hand for me, sir. I see you right in the middle. We'll bring a microphone to you. With that, Ms. Hunt, please go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, and thanks, Commissioner, again, for hosting and the Department of Ed and uh, Governor Lee. Uh, I'm Laura Hunt. I'm with uh, Tennessee CAN. We're one of the event sponsors. Um, just like Meredith McGann, uh, here to my right, uh, we both advocate at the state level for um, improvements in education across the state. Uh, I've been at every single one of these events, and we'll have, I think, three more left, right? Two more left. Um, and so um, we have we have calls with teachers and principals all across the state and uh, bring in legislators to that. We've had uh, Representative Hawk and Representative Hicks on our calls, which they're excellent representatives for you in um, Upper East Tennessee. So thanks y'all for being here today. Um, and y'all really bold for taking this on, um, like they've mentioned before. Um, but I wanna be clear that we're in support of the um, student-based funding model that they're going towards. Um, some of these things that uh, might be in the model would be uh, more support for special needs students and students with disabilities, uh, students uh, that are ESL or English language learners, uh, low-income students, rural students, that's definitely applicable to this area. And then all those wraparound services that would encompass these students, so school counselors, nurses, interventionists, RTI specialists, and social workers. And then finally, uh, more transparency for parents to be able to advocate for their students. I think the um, student funding model that they're going towards would allow for that. Um, but uh, one, just one more thing I want to mention. Um, both uh, Tennessee CAN and Tennesseans for Student Success are hosting a call this Monday as more of a deep dive um, into the current BP funding formula and what this new uh, student-based funding formula could look like. It's um, Monday at noon, and uh, there are flyers on the um, table outside from us if you would like to sign up for that, or you can see me afterwards, and I'd be happy to talk to you. So thanks so much for um, all the community support tonight. It's just nice to see that so many people in this area care so much about education for their students and improving it. Thank you so much, Ms. Hunt. Uh, next speaker is Mr. Joe Crabtree. Following Joe will be John McKinney. So John, if you could raise your hand, I see you right here. Uh, okay, with that, uh, Mr. Crabtree, please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Good evening, uh, my name is Joe Crabtree. I'm a 17-year educator, which sounds like an awful long, long time now I say that, um, in Johnson City. I have been in Johnson City teaching all 17 years. Um, I consider myself very blessed to be in a school system um, where the leaders, not just at the school system, but in the city, value our education system, putting forth extra funding than what we can get um, normally in other school systems. I know that our funding is better than other systems, and we're not um, you know, ignorant of that fact. But what I have seen, even in our school system that's very well funded and is an excellent school system, is there is still lots of funding needs. Um, I sat in a faculty meeting today, and if I start crying, I'm gonna apologize because these kids. Um, where we were, we were told that in just this quarter, this last quarter, 
we had almost 50 kids who were evaluated for crisis needs, meaning they were looking at possibly committing suicide um, and whatever else was going through them. We have got some serious needs. And like I said, I work in a system that funds that, those type of interventions very well, but I know that other school systems don't have that. Um, when we talk about educating our kids, we talk about educating the whole child. That means more than just the education that I can give them as a social studies teacher that I fight for every day. Um, but I fight for my kids first, not just the education that I give them in the subject that I teach, but I'm looking at social health, emotional health. Are they getting fed every day? Do they have the clothes they need? Do they have a bath? I mean, simple needs they have. And we are in a point now knowing that we have this possibility of building a funding system that will meet those needs. We need the funding for those extra pieces that we don't really think about when we talk about just education. Those are the kind of things that we need to have in there. But also as an educator, we need funding for resources. You know, when I first started teaching in education, resources were readily available. We get them, they were everywhere, there was funding. I have watched more and more as that funding has gone away. And it's, it's a very tight budget. I'm sitting with board members and former board members with me. I know the struggle they go through. And we need funding. And that's really all I can say there, but we need the funding for the whole child. Thank you so much, Mr. Crabtree. Our next speaker, as I mentioned, is John McKinney. Following John McKinney is David Hawk. So David, if you could raise your hand, I think I saw, yes sir, we'll bring a microphone over to you. And with that, Mr. McKinney, please go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for taking time away from your family. Um, I'm gonna make this simple. I'm a principal of a small elementary school. We're a K-8 school, 218 students. Um, we need the formula to change. Um, funding is to a point where we realize that if it doesn't change, we're gonna see drastic things. We're the counterpart to Johnson City. We have to fight for funding. They're allowed to draw from city coffers, we're not. Um, we need a, a funding model that is a student-based funding model, but it's an equity-based student funding model. You know, I think as an educator, we go back to that equity versus equality graph that we've all seen a hundred times. We need a model that takes that into account, that economically disadvantaged students get a little bit higher funding. You know, a special ed student gets a little bit higher funding. And some of that funding also needs to go directly to the schools. Um, a lot of times the money that's sent out from Nashville never makes it to the school. It gets bogged down in the politics at the county level or at the, at the district level. And so it never makes it to the teacher's classrooms. That also needs to be part of that funding model. Um, personnel. One thing that we struggle with in East Tennessee is it's much easier to go across the border in Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, that's funding is at the $10,000 plus mark, and we're down here at the $8,000 mark. And when you have a new graduate coming out of college, you know, they're looking for that start of a, of a life. Where are they gonna go teach? So you have a quality teacher problem too in our region, in my opinion, where we don't necessarily get the top candidates because they can drive 30 minutes across the border and make more money. Um, that's something that if we don't address, that's going to be a big issue in Tennessee and will continue to be a big issue in Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. McKinney. Uh, David Hawk is up next. He's right over here. Following David Hawk is Veronica Galvin. Veronica is the last person that we have on the list to speak tonight. I see you, ma'am, right in the middle. We'll bring a microphone to you. With that, Mr. Hawk, please go ahead and get started. Thank you, Commissioner Swin. Thank you for being here. Uh, nice longer. Foundation, thank you for sponsoring this as well. One of my colleagues, Tim Hicks, uh, Representative Tim Hicks, has been mentioned. Thank uh, Tim for being here, and, and Micah, thank you for the shout out and being here as well. My my interest in BEP, and, and I'm I've been fortunate to serve on our finance committee in the House ten out of the last eleven years, and been part of some of these discussions. I guess my request is to to bring the request to us to our finance committee about some of the funding issues that we've seen, and. and let us delve through those. And my interest in improving the BEP formula today is to make sure that the state, myself, 
<laughs> the state properly invests in areas where the state mandates local spending. Uh, that's always an issue where we put unfunded mandates to local governments. And I've been fortunate to serve the last 19 years, so I know some of the ins and outs of the BEP and some of the improvements we have been able to make over the last several years, uh, first being better funding for response to intervention. Um, I had a bill that would improve funding for our school nurse ratio, and hopefully we can bring that back up again. But uh, the school resource officers jumped ahead of that when public safety became a, a bigger issue in, in our districts across the state. But I'll, I'll bring to, to light the school nursing issue. Right now we're funding one nurse for every 3,000 students in a school district. Most school districts are putting more than that. They're trying to have at least one nurse per school building. If we can get closer to that, the better off we'll be. Some school di districts who can't afford that are, are actually putting one nurse in six different school buildings and making that much more challenge. So as we're hearing about the, the special needs of our students, uh, school nurses is just one area. There's many more. But I look forward to working with you, my colleagues, to, to fix some of this situation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Hawk. As I mentioned, our next speaker is Veronica Galvin. Uh, we've got a microphone coming to you, ma'am. Please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Hello, my name is Veronica Galvin, and I am a volunteer and advocate in Hamlin County, and I'm also a mother of two, um, seventh grade and ninth grade. Um, I'd like to, well, in Hamlin County, I have been part of different organizations. Um, one of them is RITA. Um, RITA is a, a program that helps further education. Well, for the Hispanic um, community and Hispanic students, well, helping in that, we noticed that um, it's not only the Hispanic students that are not wanting to further their education, but also in general. So we came up with an idea that we needed to bring this idea to middle school um, because the earlier that you get them involved in wanting to further their education, the better. Because most of the time they wait till their senior year, or either their junior or their senior year. And sometimes that's a little too late for them to want to you know, think about furthering their education. So I think that that's something as a parent, you know, a program that involves the parents and the students at an earlier age to think about, okay, what are we gonna do after we graduate? Where are we gonna go? What are my options? And also to educate the parents on what are the options for your students? Because most of the time, their parents didn't go to college. They didn't go, they didn't do anything. So they don't know what the process is. And that's where we're stuck in Hamlin County right now with a lot of their parents. They don't know what to do, um, how to help their children. So I think that there needs to be funding for that especially. And that way, you know, our middle schoolers, the earlier you get that information to them, the better, I think. So they don't feel as lost. And as a parent, so I don't feel as lost either. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Gallman. Um, I spoke a little bit too soon. We actually have one additional speaker, Karen Becks. Karen, if you could raise your hand. Yes, ma'am, we're in the back corner over here, folks. Please go ahead and get started with your two minutes. Hi, my name is Dr. Karen Davis Becks, and I stand before you as a 27-year educator. I just started really young. So um, I have been an advocate for special needs since before I was in school. IDEA has never been fully funded at the federal level. Let's think about that. Never been funded at the federal level. So our local and state localities take up the slack. The BEP funding needs to be able to allocate to our children who do need more without taking from the neighbor. It is so important, it, right now especially. Our students have been left at home, high need, and they haven't been reached. Unless we can stop that and put things in place, it's just gonna be a nightmare. And I do agree with pre-K, we've gotta start the foundation strong. Before RTI, we were waiting for our students to fail. So all of those initiatives need to be looked at. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, that should conclude our period of public comment. I know we've had a lot of inspiration here tonight. If there is anyone else who would like to speak, I'll ask you to throw your hand up. Yes, ma'am, I see you. We'll come to you. If you don't mind, ma'am, when you get on the microphone, please just say your name for us and then go ahead with your two minutes. I'll kind of tell you when you can get okay. started. Uh, my name is Paula Therese. I did sign up. I guess oh. it just didn't, didn't go through somehow. Thank you so much. Please go um, ahead. I'm a parent in Johnson City Schools. I'm also a former school board member and I'm a leader in PTA and I have been at the state level 
level and at the local level. Um, one of the things that I've seen throughout the years with the basic education, with the BEP funding, is it doesn't fund things that we require for graduation. For example, physical education is only funded through the sixth grade, yet we have a requirement for everyone to have PE in high school. So our local education agencies are funding that. Um, also, music and arts education is not funded past the sixth grade. And there are a lot of very rural communities in our area that can't fund it because their school boards can't find the funding for that. There have been numerous studies saying music education and arts education is very important. It actually helps the brain and helps with student testing. Not that student testing is my thing, but it does help educate our kids as fully rounded individuals. Another thing that we get a lot of time, and I'm not dissing the two gentlemen in front of me, <laughs> but there's a lot of times that our legislature comes up with these unfunded man ma mandates and they say this is a great thing and they require our, our school boards to take care of it, but then we have to, our school boards and our, our schools have to figure out a way to fund it. If we have those, we need to figure out a way if, to them to not be unfunded mandates. They need to be funded by the state and not put that burden on our school boards, especially our extremely rural school boards that have tough times funding just basic things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Latrice. Appreciate all of you who provided some public comment tonight. Uh, before I turn things back over to Commissioner Schwinn, I am going to uh, make a, a shameless plug for us. Would really like for you all to feel encouraged to submit your comments in writing. As I was reading kind of the opening remarks, I made a comment that we really want to see those in writing. There is an email address that you can send those comments to. It is tnedu.funding at tn.gov. Uh, when my clicker comes behind the curtain, I will change the slide so that you can write that down or take a quick snapshot. But really would like to encourage all of you to please submit that public comment. If there are things that you would like to have, go to our subcommittees for review and consideration. So please don't forget about that email address opportunity. Take advantage of it and encourage your friends and family to do the same. So with that, Commissioner Schwinn, I know uh, we have a couple more minutes uh, to spend together, and so I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, and I do what it is I usually do, especially because of the lighting. I can't see the faces of my team, and so that's always dangerous for them. But I will open it up for questions also. Um, I know we've, we've done that at a number of town halls, especially as people are getting um, their ideas flowing and starting to think a little bit more. Want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity, even if you don't have something you want to say publicly, if there are questions that are coming up for you, either about what this means, what a timeline could be, how to get involved differently. We want to make sure that we, we open up that time for you. So I know that's putting everyone on the spot. I'm trying to eke out a little bit more thinking time for people. Um, but if you have a question and just want to raise your hand, we're happy to address that um, and, and talk through that if, if that's of interest to anybody. So does anyone have a question that you might want? Yes, Here. sir. Yeah, great question. So if you couldn't hear, I was going to say, I'm like, I've got Representative Hawk, I know, to my left, who has some strong feelings about that. Um, and so I think we are looking at a lot of sources of funding for a potential recommendation that would then potentially be considered by the General Assembly and to kind of link the two. And also, if you want to respond to that at all, sir, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to. Scott, if you can grab him a mic, thank you. Um, but, but do want to also acknowledge that we will go through the Finance Committee, Education Committees, and I think there's lots of different places where we could potentially look at some of these hopes and dreams that we're talking about tonight, but I'll defer to you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. And to your point, the, when the lottery was set up in 2004, although it was voted in in 2002, folks thought they were voting for a lottery for general education. Not so. Uh, the lottery itself was put in place for higher education, the higher education scholarships, with the caveat that any excess lottery funds could be used for capital improvements to K-12 through facilities or pre-K. So we funded uh, the beginnings of some expansion of pre-K back in the Bredesen years with some of the lottery dollars, $25 million. And then we've created a, an energy efficient school fund that has a revolving fund where folks can, can uh, school systems can borrow money for heat and air, roofs, things like that. So the lottery itself was not set up at all for K-12 through education. Uh, fast forward to the other point that you brought up about use of the, the new online sports betting. 
Uh, Representative Hicks and I have a bill in place right now in the Tennessee legislature that would discuss how those funds could be used. I would like to see those funds come into the K through 12 system. Right now, our legislation states it would go toward capital improvements to free up some of those capital dollars that school systems are using to go toward in classroom costs. Um, we are open to any idea. Several of my colleagues would like to see it go toward helping with uh, the RTI, uh, helping with nursing ratios, as I mentioned before. So those, those options are available to us. At the moment, on a conservative level, we're looking at bringing in with the online sports betting between $40 million a year, $50 million a year. So in the whole scheme of things, that's not a lot of money, but it, it beats not having anything at all. So that is a possibility that's being discussed. Thanks for allowing me to color that answer, Commissioner. Yes, sir. Of course. <laughs> Other questions, please feel free to raise your hand. There's one over here. Victoria is going to bring a microphone to you. If you have another questions, feel free to just kind of stick your hand up and I'll try and direct our, our microphone folks. Can you hear me? We yes, can sir. hear you. Dave McLean, Director of Green County Schools. Here's a question I have. In, in Upper East Tennessee, of course, across the state, you have around 144 school districts. We're compared across the state when you look at TCAP, EOC, ACT. Uh, the media, whoever that may be, you're always comparing data, test scores, et cetera. If you look at that data, research shows in Upper East Tennessee, when per pupil expenditure in districts is higher, no doubt those scores are higher. Uh, I get the issue, especially city systems, uh, you have sales tax dollars that's able to increase that local fund. So is there much discussion going on of how to equalize that maybe for rural districts? Because let's be honest, the majority of those sales tax dollars are being spent in cities by rural county people. So what's looked at if we're being compared in reference to ACT and, and EOC, how can we be um, certainly measured and supposed to be performing at that level when we're not uh, financially being supported at that level. So what's going on in those discussions, if any? Yes, sir, that's a great question. And I wanna start by saying we are, our thoughts and prayers are with you um, over, over the accident. Um, in terms of rural communities, this is a great example of what we can talk about in a student-based funding formula. So a lot, when, when you look at those across the country, you have what's called a base. So that is um, if you take a day in the life of a child, any child, let's say at the elementary school level, what do we need to fund for every student, no matter what, wherever they live in the state? And those are things like the cost of custodial services, the cost of the instruction, maybe a paraprofessional, counselors and nurses, special education would be slightly different, but every single child would need the same thing. Then you think about what's called the weights. That's where we talk about a student base. What are the needs that that child has? We normally talk about what's called the big three, and that's economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, and then English learners. In a student-based formula, we can think about weighting rural communities. So we know, for example, it is more expensive for transportation, especially in our large rural communities. We also know there might not be a Boys and Girls Club and a YMCA and all these other organizations that are all around. We know there might not be the same tax base in a rural community. And so what that allows is for any student who is in a rural community outside of the base, they might get a weight or a percentage on top of that to help fund some of these additional needs and resources. That allows for equity across. So every student, again, would get additional dollars for a disability, a language, maybe K2 if we want to focus on early reading, rural urban, uh, you can think about, we heard in uh, prior town halls, um, the density or concentration of poverty at a certain school. Those are all things that can add additional funds and allow for some of our districts who might not have that same tax base to get some additional funding to support in a way that maybe is not as equal right now. So I think there's a lot of things and that's part of where we're co collecting this level of feedback. It gives us a sense of where those inequities might exist and where we might want to think differently about how we fund individual students to create a little bit more parity between districts. So thank you for that question and giving me the chance to talk a little bit more about it. Also want to say hello to Director Simcox and I see a couple other directors here that I haven't called out. So hello, we've got Bristol and Kingsport and I think we've got a state board. Yes, we do. Hello, uh, oh, state board member Nick Darnell is also back there. So um, thank you very much for the question and hopefully that provides a little bit more clarity there. Love the shout outs, Commissioner. Any additional questions from the audience tonight? I wanna to make sure we've got one down here. We'll bring a microphone to you, ma'am. Is there someone else who might uh, want to ask a question this evening? Oh, right 
in the middle. Yes. Oh, I see you. Yes. Okay, we'll bring a microphone to you, ma'am. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Uh, Cindy Luttrell, Greenville City Schools Board Chair. You know, over the years, we've really had to fight as board members about vouchers, charter schools, public schools, and, and that's from the top on, on down. Um, and I guess I just want to ask, what's the mechanism that's in place to really try to promote public funding to go into public schools? Over the last few years, I feel like public schools have just really been torn down and we've been our worst enemy. And so what are we doing to just make sure that those public funds go into public schools, that we build public education back up and uh, protect them when you've got other schools that we've been competing against that aren't held to the same standards? Yeah, I appreciate that question. And so a couple of things um, I want to be able to address there. So one is, anytime we're talking about this funding formula um, and a potentially new funding formula, we are talking exclusively about public schools. Um, that is currently what is in the law. I know there's been a lot. There's student-based funding formula here, and then I always like to say, way over here, there's money follows the student. Those are completely different policies. What we are talking about in this conversation is funding for the public school system. Now, that does include public charter schools, public magnet schools, public art schools that might be authorized by a local school district, for example. But this would just be funding that would go towards public schools. Um, I think one of the things that uh, you brought up that I kind of want to expand upon a little bit is just this idea of how do we continue to accelerate, boost, and elevate the work that's happening in our public schools across the state. Um, and so I think this is actually a great conversation for us to think about what we want to be true, so what we hope we can do in public school. Also, what we know we are doing maybe at a smaller scale that is working that we might want to make sure we're continuing. I've had the great, um, we can call it a lot of things, I'm going to call it the privilege of reading um, all of our district ESSER plans, and uh, it's given me a really good idea of what our districts are doing, how they are spending some of their federal relief dollars, and the innovative ways that they are thinking differently about how they can support their students. There are a lot of really good stories to tell in these plans. I deeply believe that over the next three years, there will be a lot of great stories to tell about the outcomes that produces for kids. This is a time where in developing a new funding formula that may or may not ideally will get proposed to the General Assembly and we can work through on that, this is a time to have kind of what those promising practices are, think about how we fund that, and again, amplify some of the great stories we have to tell across the state in our public school systems. You've got, got a, a lot of great leaders here who are doing some great work. I will say the Kindy 500 might be my favorite thing that I've seen, um, but it is, there's a lot of great work happening in our public schools, and I want to make sure that um, that is part of the conversation we think about what we might want to fund in the future. So I appreciate kind of that two-part question and a chance to, to respond to that. Thank you so much. We have a question right here in the middle. Any additional questioners tonight? Go ahead, oh, right next door. So you can just pass the microphone. Please go ahead, ma'am. Um, this question involves capital project fund funding. So in the county that I live in, the county has decided to fund their capital projects by cash only, and the law states that they are allowed to do that. But in doing that and not by bonding, it has given our city school district, taken money away from our city school district to the tune now of about $100 million. So they're building capital projects but we're not able to, and it should be split on a per rata basis based on average daily attendance. Um, it's not being done. What can you do to help us either get that law changed or get those funding? Because if it's happening in our county, it could technically be happening in any county that has a, both a county and city school systems. Yeah, it, that's a great question, and what I can say, and I know this will be a slightly unsatisfactory answer, but it is the honest one, um, that is that um, I personally can't do much, but what I can do is I can make sure, again, that all of this information gets coded and provided. I will say in, in, in conversations like that, especially the facilities conversation, my strong recommendation is there's two different ways to contribute there, and your comment will certainly be part of the record. Um, and that is, one, what are parts of facilities that we may or may not want to include in ideas for a current uh, or a new funding formula. That might be something that we want to include as part of that conversation as the state of Tennessee. 
Separately, there are a lot of comments that are coming in about those capital projects, whether those are new projects, especially for those fast growing districts or districts that have very old buildings, as well as deferred maintenance, which we know is a significant issue, again, seeing a lot of that in our, in our SR plans. And so that might be another thing where we'll put that and say it's not for this particular comment, not saying yours, but that might not be for the funding formula, but it is still a really important policy consideration for our General Assembly, and we want to make sure that they get that information. So all of that will be welcomed and included, and again, for those of you who this is spurring a lot of other ideas, um, if it is not specific to the formula, we will still put that into the record, and it might be one where maybe it is for the formula, and if it doesn't make it, we still want to put it over here. So I think that's one of those great examples, and I appreciate that. Sir, please go ahead with your question. I think we've got time for just a couple more. If there is another individual, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, I will get a microphone over to you while you are asking your question, sir. Please go ahead. Since I have the microphone anyway. She was next door. Um, my question is really about um, class size. You know, I teach seventh grade and I have currently 30 to 35 students in my class. While I can maintain that and we, we do amazing things in my class, I think about what we could do with smaller class sizes. If I had a class of 20, 25 kids, what you know, more detailed or what more individualized learning they could have and experience that way instead of me trying to manage, you know, I don't wanna say a horde of children, but 35 students is a lot of teenagers at once. Um, what kind of funding is gonna be in this mechanism? I know part of it is, again, is state law. Um, I know that pretty well. I've been fighting that one for a long time but what kind of funding can we have in place to lower the class sizes, especially in the middle grades and the higher grades where the class sizes can be anywhere from 30 to 40, 45 students, which I can't imagine teaching a class that size. Yes, sir. So I, I will say that you are speaking to my husband's heart. My husband was a middle school uh, teacher, um, and he would have, uh, he had class sizes of about 42 middle schoolers. I was a high school teacher, and they went down to the babies who I love, um, and they were sitting on kind of the radiators. And so he, he would appreciate that comment, I will say. Um, but one of the ways that we can address that in, in a funding formula, hypothetically, and we will take that comment uh, for the record, is that you look, at, you look at class sizes. So we know we've got that 1 to 20 in the elementary school. It might be something that as a state we say, a value is that we want to make sure that we limit middle school class sizes to 1 to 25 or something like that. That is, that is an additional expense, right? That is an additional cost, and that would have to be considered. If that's something that goes in into the recommendations, we would then cost that out for the entire state, and that would go into that base that I was talking about. So you have that middle school base. Students would be funded, assuming that they have no more than, let's say, 25 other classmates um, in middle school, 20 in, in elementary school, and maybe something similar in high school. So um, I think that that's a really good point. We're hearing that a lot, actually. Class sizes is one of the biggest pieces of feedback we're getting, along with special education counselors, nurses, um, and a lot on financial literacy. Just, um, I wasn't expecting that, so that was kind of a, a fun development. But um, I think class size ratios is something that we'll absolutely put into the record, and, and especially for middle and high school, so appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Any final questions from you folks tonight? I see one way over here. Scott, you're gonna have to run real quick. He is right in the middle on this far side. Any additional folks go, Scott, who would like go. to ask a, ask a question? <laughs> Okay, sir, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Patrick Fraley, I'm a 30-year educator in many different school systems in East Tennessee. Um, one thing that I would, would like for us to have the opportunity to, to express and, and for it to be thought about when, you, when you're talking about class size is looking at the number of schools that are in a district when we look at class size instead of considering the district to be one school. So when we are adding up how many middle school students we have and divide that number by 20, when you have a school that's 30 miles away from other schools and it only has seven, but then you have to have 30 in the other school to be able to fund through that. If we could just take into consideration somehow the number of schools, that decision has been made at the local level at what's best for the local school system to be able to efficiently use their funds. So we could take that into consideration. The other thing I would, I would say is consideration that whether a student is in attendance or whether they're just a member, if they're a member of our school, average daily membership is the funding instead of attendance because we all know the more a student is absent, the more resources we have to put with that student, but instead we get less resources when those students don't come to school. 
So I would like those things to be considered. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And so I heard two of those points. I think the second one we've heard quite a bit, especially from our districts. On the first one, I want to give that as an example, because um, I think it's actually a really important example on student-based formulas. So you have that base. And again, um, when we think about our rural schools, we know that a lot of our rural uh, schools and rural districts, you can't, you can't just bus a student over 30 or 40 miles away. Um, and so that's one of the benefits of being able to consider a rural weight. So we know that we've got especially really small schools and hypothetically a ratio where you have a certain number of a couple hundred students generates a principal, but you have some really small schools in rural areas where it doesn't make sense to consolidate and they're never gonna generate the full funding for a principal and therefore they're gonna have to pull out of their local coffers to fund that. This allows for you to put a, a different weight or an additional weight for those rural schools so that they still have the same resources funded by the state that any other school would have and we don't have those disparities. So I think it's a really important example and one that certainly I see a lot across the state and appreciate you sharing that today. Thank you. Any final questions? We will give one last opportunity before the commissioner kind of gives us some closing remarks. One more, right down here, gentleman in the orange shirt. We'll bring you a microphone, sir. Please go ahead. That brings up something, his comment brings up something to my mind, which is treating school systems individually versus treating them as a county. I think that would go a long way into addressing some issues that we have is to treat each individual school system individually versus counties as a whole. What's your take on that? I think that we are hearing a lot about that topic, and so um, that is something that's coming up. I've had a chance to talk to a, a few uh, directors of schools one-on-one -on -one about this. I think um, we're hearing that a lot, especially when you've got the county and city systems, or we have a couple places where you might have five or six districts within one county, um, and they all have very different needs. And I think we've heard a couple comments even here tonight. I can't imagine we're not gonna continue to hear that. So um, I think it's an important consideration and certainly one that I, I do believe this process will help elevate how to address some of those challenges. So I appreciate that. Um, so no other questions, although I am in red, so I'm easy to find. I'm also about 100 feet tall, so uh, that, is, that is also makes me easy to find after this. Um, I do wanna thank you all for coming out tonight. I also wanna say that this is not hopefully the first time that you engage and have these conversations. This is a, this is a process. We're not gonna to get to a perfect solution or a perfect recommendation. It is going to require all of us to continue to think, to iterate, to go talk to our neighbors, our friends, other people in school systems, and really dream big about what we want to accomplish. I also want to say that this, is, this comes with accountability and responsibility for us to have some really thoughtful ways to contribute to what's going to improve outcomes for students in this state. And I also want to say that if we're talking about a student-based funding formula, what that means is more transparency to the public. It does mean that we will have the reporting that I know we are constantly asked for by our General Assembly members um, and want to be able to answer to. It means that parents are going to have more information about the individual ways in which their students are funded. And it does mean that we will be able to tie some of the hopes and dreams and outcomes that we want for our kids and know what's being funded and what, what success we've had with that. I deeply believe that if we fund the things that we know will move our state forward, our state will accelerate very quickly and we have seen that over the last 18 months. Our public schools do incredible work in this state. They do incredible work. And I wanna make sure that we're able to tell those stories and make sure when we see those best practices, the things that are allowing us to more than triple work-based learning, to make sure that we have programs where, and I'm looking at Jeff back there, um, I'm not gonna say it right, but programs where we are looking at ocean patterns and things that I didn't even understand, sir, if I'm being honest, but it sounded amazing when your students said it, that they have those opportunities that they otherwise might not have had. That's what we want out of this. This is all about kids. It can't be about anything except kids. And I will be very honest in saying that sometimes the hardest part is to actually make it about kids and not about adults. And so if we are thinking about what must be true for every student, whether that is a low-income student in a rural community in Northwest Tennessee, whether that is a student in a city district in, let's say, Chattanooga, whether that is a student here in Northeast Tennessee, they should be given the same opportunities no matter where they live. They should know that they can have the same dreams and accomplish those dreams no matter where they live. It is our responsibility as adults to make that happen. I do believe we are on a path to doing that through this process, and I'm very, very grateful for you all contributing tonight, both as a commissioner, but also as a mama um, who cares deeply about her three kids and sees a million other of them at Kroger on the freeway and at soccer games on Saturday. So it matters a lot to all of our families, to you all, and certainly to our kids, and I really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much and hope you continue the conversation.
Thank you, Commissioner. I will definitely not close as eloquently as you all, but please take advantage of that email address, send us your public comments, and thank you again for attending. That all adjourn us for this evening.